Welcome to Transformative Principle, where you learn how to be a leader and not just a manager of a to-do list. I am your host, Jethro Jones. You can find me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. Over the past several years, you've heard me talk a lot about the mastermind, and I keep thinking it really is the best professional development that you can get. So what I'm going to be doing over the next couple of weeks is just reading some of the things that people have said have been most useful to them from our hour together. So here's the first one. Uh, the discussion about a high school principal, even though it was at a different level. And one person said this week, it was the quietest hour I've had in the last week. So those are just two reasons of what people are getting out of the mastermind. If you're curious about it, check out jethrojones.com slash mastermind and just schedule a call and let's chat about whether or not it's the right fit for you. That's jethrojones.com slash mastermind. This episode is brought to you by John Cat Educational, a professional development publisher serving as the global leader in combining both research and practice in all materials. Find timely PD publications to support yourself and your faculty by visiting them online at us.johncatbookshop.com. Welcome to Transformative Principal. I am very excited to have Dr. Brian Brockett here on the program today. He is a principal in Carlsbad, California. And Dr. Brockett, welcome and thank you for joining Transformative Principal. Hey, Jethro. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's uh, great to have a chance to step back and talk a little bit. Yeah. So the way that we connected is really great. One of my teachers and one of your teachers mentioned each other on Twitter, saw each other's Twitter post or something, and we I noticed that you were outside in the uh, beautiful Southern California weather when it was currently negative 30 up here in Fairbanks <laughs> and thought <laughs> that is, I wouldn't mind that seat outside, uh, sitting outside, you're doing something, I don't remember what it was, but my teacher commented that that seems like something I'd, that I would be doing as a principal. And I said, absolutely, if there were palm trees involved, I wouldn't have an office. <laughs> so um, so anyway, after talking about that, uh, your teacher commented what an amazing principal you are and how you do such a good job at building culture. So I figured that we should get together. So that's how we met and how this came to be. And what I love is that just two random principals can connect on the internet. And, and now we're going to teach some amazing things about building culture. So so let's start with a little bit of your background as a principal, how you got to where you are, and just the you know, brief summary of your experience leading to where you're at now. Yeah. So I'm, this is my, ooh, I think, fourth year, no, third year, I guess, third full year at, uh, at Carlsbad High School. I previously was in our district here as a, a middle school principal for three years, and then an assistant principal at a middle school before that for two. And, and prior to that, my, my teaching background and was in uh, in the area here in North County, San Diego, both at the middle school and high school levels for, uh, I guess, 14 years as a teacher, coach, and then moved over into uh, into administration. So I uh, have really enjoyed that and really uh, enjoy being back at the high school level. I, I, I love both middle school and high school, um, having done both in, in uh, capacities as teacher, uh, teacher, coach, and um, administrator. But, you know, high school is great because you've got, you've got students who are kind of on the cusp of really stepping out in the world on their own. And, you know, it's a kind of a different level of, of interaction and, and uh, you know, preparation for helping them to take those next steps, which I really enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. My heart's in middle school. I love the the weirdness and the awkwardness of that stage. So, so that's where I love being. As I mentioned before we got on that this year, I'm over high school that's in the prison system and a high school that's a homeschool program. And I can see the appeal of, uh, of that age group. And, you know, if we listen to the media and movies, we see that kids are, high school kids especially, are either 100% like totally focused on education or don't care at all about it. Can you mm -hmm. speak to that difference and how you help your help your students move more towards caring about life? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I I think like anything else, and I think you know what what connected us to have the conversation in the first place is really all about that the relationships and the connection, and and I think that um, over the course of high school, you know, students come from middle school and they're and they're uh, kind of back at the bottom of the pile again, if you will, in terms of mm -hmm. uh, you know they've got the classes above them, and you know I think as freshmen, a lot of our freshmen aren't necessarily looking long term and thinking about their future, and when we hit 
get you know, senior year, and especially as we get on through the year and senior year, you really have seen that transformation take place with students coming through. And, and they start to realize that they're really on the cusp of, of, you know, stepping out on their own and leaving high school behind. And I think that seeing that maturity kick in, and I, I, I you know, fast forwarded through four years there, obviously, but, you know, I think that, that when you have the, the relationship and you, and you prioritize that, and I think, uh, you know, uh, I've got great examples of teachers that do that and coaches that, that really, you know, you, you start to treat high school uh, students like young adults that they are and, and, you know, kind of hold that level of expecting responsibility and expecting, you know, them to be able to have a conversation with you and discuss things, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent or uh, whatever it may be. And, and, and to engage them as kind of human beings. I really think that that's, that's the importance of, of cultivating that and, and cultivating that preparedness. I think the more that the more that we as educators treat students like they're like they're uh, not equally human like us and have the same you know thoughts and fears and concerns and insecurities and everything like that, the more they're going to try to you know push back and and try to stay away from engaging with us as adults. And the more that we, we, you know, give them that respect and realize that like we're, we're all human beings who kind of wanted to be treated the same way and want to be given that level of responsibility and respect and uh, expectation, I think, for, for doing, you know, our best work, whether that's in the classroom or the work that we do, you know, uh, as teachers and administrators on campus. I, I think that's a key part of it is just really having that, that piece where we uh, have respect for students. You mentioned the, the prison school thing. I, and one of the things that I've always laughed about is one component of that in our schools, we've got a, a campus supervisor team. I mean, six, I think six or seven campus supervisors off the top of my head. And, and they're amazing. They know the kids, they interact with them, they, they're up there. And, and conversely, sometimes I, I know you, you go to schools where you've got sort of quote unquote prison guard mentality, if you will, where mm-hmm. you know, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to keep people in line and keep them down and keep them between these lines and this, that, and the other, which has its place, right? In, in, in a prison setting, perhaps. But it, a high school shouldn't feel like that, I don't think. Uh, you know, comprehensive high school should feel like an exciting place of learning and collaboration and, and respect and growth, you know, and, and those things don't happen if, you know, kids feel like you've got your thumb down on them all the time. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that that piece of feeling like you're your inner prison is a is a tough place to feel. And I know a lot of kids have felt that way. You know, we recently did something where I I was in a position of being a principal on a special assignment, which means that I was helping to do things like rewrite our discipline policy and rewrite our dress code and things like that, where we just need somebody to like buckle down and do that work because it just wasn't getting done otherwise. And so we rewrote our dress code policy to be more basically forgiving of students and allow them to express themselves individually. And we really took this approach of it's about you respecting yourself and your position of being a learner and coming dressed to learn. And so like we expect teachers to come dressed to teach and we expect the administrators to come dressed to do their job. And so you need to come dressed to do your job. And so for some people, that means a lot of different things. But once we gave them that permission to to be themselves and to express themselves in their own way, what's funny is that a lot of the dress code problems that we complained about before, a lot of them just disappeared because a lot of kids were doing that just to rebel. And when they right. didn't have that thing to rebel against because they didn't feel <laughs> oppressed, <laughs> then, right. then they they changed, you know? Right. And that's right. exactly what you're talking about here. So how do you how do you build that culture to where that's that's an okay place to be and it's not crazy to to treat these kids like they're human beings yeah you know i mean i think i think it it one it as a as a leader you've got to model that um approach two i think you have to be explicit about that approach three i think you have to look for opportunities to you know do that you you mentioned i I wouldn't have even thought about dress code to be honest with you but you you were right on because uh, you know we we actually did the same thing a couple years ago we had a, a concern come up from a few female students that our dress code was you know targeting specifically uh, women's fashion and I, I laugh because I've you know I've been around long enough as have you you know a few years ago it was the you know when guys were sagging their pants the the dress code then seemed to uh, target the guys who were doing that right 
right? But you know, fashion comes full circle and changes around. But it, but it was important to us to go back through there and and really take a look at that and 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 honor that feedback, you know? So we brought in one of the students who was a leader on this, brought in some parents, brought in some staff and, and looked at it and did the exact same thing you're talking about. Instead of a, a dress code, it developed what we called a dress culture and, you know, put that into practice with the same thing. I mean, look, is, is it perfect? No, I mean, certainly uh, some people's interpretation of what's appropriate to come for learning is a little bit different right. than mine might be on some days, but we can also have, we also, you know, can approach that from a conversation standpoint rather than a, a retribution type standpoint for for breaking a rule because the way it's set up it, it kind of lends itself more to reflecting and thinking about uh, what's going on so you know that's it's a great example you shared and, and and I'd say the same thing about just looking for those examples to value that input and especially as we can cultivate that student input and student voice in um, those types of little things that we do I think then the the more that we start to you know we more, more we start to cultivate cultivate that kind of environment, the more we can share that student uh, voice back with students as, as things that, that they care about by, you know, soliciting input from kids, soliciting, you know, questions from them about things when times are tough, whatever it may be, or, and then share that voice back out to teachers as well. Because teachers, you know, I mean, teachers get into the, the business, obviously, because they want to, they want to work with kids. I mean, they, they enjoy that. I, I've never met a teacher who, who didn't, but you, you get a uh, hundred and uh, 80 kids on your roster coming through and you know you're you're work we're a block schedule so you might be working with 80 90 100 kids a day on an alternating block and you don't have time always to sit back and you know really dig into what's going on with all of your students and really get their input on things and you know there's there's some ways to do that and and, and yet even for the best uh, teachers that can be challenging sometimes so you know finding ways to get that voice out too I, I think is is very uh, useful in, in whatever mechanisms you can use to do that. Hey, guess what? I've got a book coming out. How exciting is that? It's called School X, and it's all about helping you as a principal be a designer of your school and not just a manager. So I hope you'll check it out. You can download the free chapter at schoolx.me. So just go to schoolx.me to download the first free chapter. And once you get it, hit reply to the email and tell me what you think. Looking forward to sharing that with you. That's schoolx.me. Yeah, so, you know, it's one thing to to build a culture by modeling and being an example. But that last piece you said about, about getting that out there, how do, you, how do you get your culture out? And how do you talk about it in a way that, that people can buy into it better? What's your advice for doing that? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I one of the things that that I uh, I think that bores a lot of people or, or people feel sometimes is disingenuous uh, is is really you know starting around what your vision is and articulating that clearly. You know, uh, you and I talked a, a little bit before we started here about you know the uh, the school closures and the coronavirus situation and everything. And from the beginning of that, one of the things that I started to do because. You know, we with our teachers uh, talk about a, a just a quantum change and leap in, you know, what they were doing just overnight. And, and some schools were obviously, you know, just because the way they were set up, uh, whether whether through homeschool or remote learning already, were, were well positioned to do that. But, you know, when you take uh, over 100 teachers and 2,400 students and move them home, that doesn't happen overnight. And so one of the things that I try to do is because we've taken the time uh, to refine our vision, talk about what our vision is, you know, I started using that as, as a piece kind of out every week or so in my communications to say, hey, remember, here's here's what we are all about. Here's what we strive to be all about, say we're all about. And and this week, let's focus on this. You know, so uh, like from the get-go, you know, one of our pieces is that we're engaged in building a positive and supportive environment. So I was explicit with teachers, you know, early on in that process to say, hey, this week, that's what we're focusing on. We're building a positive and supportive environment just in a new context. So we need to kind of rebuild that. We need to make sure we're making contact with our kids. We make sure we're just communicating out. We need to make sure we're looking out for our colleagues and, and supporting them in this situation. 
And so I think that by having that grounding, that that kind of touchstone with a clear vision of, of who you are and what you're all about, I, I think that's one tool that I rely on to do that very explicitly. I think that we also have to honor, we have to honor, you know, the work that our teachers do to kind of live out that vision. So, you know, a couple of examples of that, I, you know, going back earlier in the school year, this last year, you know, we, we took our instructional rounds kind of formula that we used to use. And, you know, the, to be honest with you, you know, it, people do instructional rounds differently. And I have to be honest, uh, you know, I've never found a really effective way to get that process going at my sites to just, you know, really give, you know, meaningful feedback and really be looking for meaningful things. And, you know, it's kind of a sense of frustration. And I was talking to one of my teacher uh, leaders uh, who, who was kind of calling me out on that at one point. And I, all of a sudden I realized that she's right. I don't know why I'm even trying to make an argument that this is like really actually doing us any good because, you know, we're not, we're not getting good feedback that we're given to teachers. We're, you know, what are we really doing with this data that we're gathering? What's the point of some of this data that we're gathering, et cetera. And so we, we took that this year and we took our, our district mission, we took our, our school vision, and then we also worked last year with a group of uh, called our culture committee, which is teachers and staff and uh, students. It's a you know select group of teacher, staff, and students who get together to talk about some of the cultural issues and, and, and questions that we have. It's a good ex- chance to exchange between uh, teachers and students. And we developed a, a, what's called a profile of a Lancer. That's our mascot. Just mm-hmm. some, some things that we want our students to be able to say about themselves. And just, to, you know, so it's I'm caring and understanding. I'm self-aware. I'm resilient. And I matter. And so we took those, those three pieces, the mission, the vision, our po- profile of a Lancer. And then instead of doing kind of traditional data gathering in a, you know, instructional rounds model, what I did was on the, I printed that on a, one side of the paper uh, and on the opposite side, we just had four boxes there for jotting down observations. And so what we took our, our instructional rounds this, uh, this last year and turned them into is we sit down uh, with, with whoever's participating ahead of time and we go through a step-by-step and say, okay, remind us, we're going to remember what our mission is. We're going to remember our vision. Here's our profile will answer. And then we go out and into classrooms and what we do is we specifically look for those items, those things, uh, evidence of those things taking place in the classrooms. So I'm, I'm now kind of trying to put into action what it is that we're looking for. And then I'm able to to wrap that up. And we we debrief at the end, which is really the most powerful part of it. We go around and and talk about kind of what we saw. And then I'm able to put back, you know, articulate in, in writing back to teachers and say, we came in your classroom this morning. Here are, you know, some of the specific things that we we saw uh, that pertain to, you know, our vision, for example. We, you know, we really appreciated seeing how you were challenging students or empowering the students to do X, Y, and Z. And so, you know, it's a it's a way to kind of explicitly and yet still subtly kind of reinforce the positive things that are going on in Mm -hmm. classrooms uh, or out on campus or whatever it may be. And so, you know, that's one, you know, one approach. The other approach I think is, you know, in making sure, and it's that, that last piece is, is that, that feedback to teachers, you know, I I think that one of the things that, that I it, like a lot. I read a lot of George Koros' stuff. I'm, I'm sure you uh, are yeah. familiar as well. And, you know, he, he has, his bit about making the positive so loud, you know, you can't hear the negative. And I think that that's, you know, one approach as well as making sure that you're communicating those positives back and exactly and being specific. Feedback, right, is, is, is only good as far as it's specific to what's going on. So just like you know, if, if there's something that needs to be fixed, that feedback needs to be very specific as well. But I think the specific positive feedback, and I think about, you know, just the other day getting a, a really nice email from a, a parent and being able to just reach out to the three teachers that, that she mentioned in there and, and share with them specifically what it was that she had appreciated about, about those three individuals. And, you know, we've been through obviously some some uh, upheaval uh, in education recently. And, and, you know, it's, it's great to get that specific feedback. And then, you know, teachers respond, you know, I just got an email a few minutes ago from one of those teachers saying, I appreciate that. That made my week just getting that, Mm -hmm. you know, one little bit of positive feedback. So, you know, I think that for me, that's a, a big part of that building culture is, 
is that, you know, being explicit about what it is that you're after and then reinforcing positively those places where you see it. And, you know, the flip side, obviously, is you can't look at everything through those colored glasses. Every, you know, there are times when you need to call out the things that you, that you don't see that are match or that you see that are not matching that vision as well. But I do think that's, uh, you know, keeping yourself focused on what it is that you're actually trying to do is incredibly important. John Cat Educational supports high-quality teaching and learning by providing publications that are research-based, practical, and focused on the key topics proven essential in today's and tomorrow's schools. The latest John Cat publications include a book whose bold, transformative ideas amaze and infuriate people around the world, according to one reviewer, a title from Global Leaders in Curriculum Planning, Practice, and Retrieval, one book that says stop talking and start doing with regard to teacher well-being, and much more. These books, used by educators of all roles across North America and worldwide, amplify fresh, engaging voices with practical strategies to create transformative change. Learn more in our show notes at jethrojones.com slash podcast. I think one thing that's really important that, that we don't want to overlook is this idea that if you have a vision, then it's a lot easier to call out the things that aren't matching with your vision, and it's a lot easier to say why they're not good. You know, a lot of times I've seen where principals are trying to, you know, give feedback to teachers or coach them on something, but the principal themselves, they don't have a vision. And so what they end up doing is they, so they do have a vision. Their vision is basically don't break anything and just make it to next year. Right. So that I can keep doing this until I retire. And I'm not saying that dismissively or anything. It's just that when that's what your vision is, when that's what your goal is, is to just survive. That's called being a manager and not being a leader. It's not, casting a vision. You know, in the mastermind that I do where I coach principals once a week, it's really, really powerful reading this book called The Vision Driven Leader by Michael Hyatt. And he is a great leadership guru who who helps in a lot of different ways. But really what we're able to focus on is you have to have a vision for your school. And one of the principals in that mastermind the other day just said, you know, I'm frustrated with how things are going because our We don't really have a place where we're trying to go. Like they don't have a profile of a Lancer, you know, for their specific school. And those things are so important because once you know what they are, then when you see something that's not that, like if we're trying to create caring and compassionate students, if you have a teacher who's not modeling that, or you have a student who's not modeling that, then the conversation is completely different. Hey, this is what we do. We are caring and compassionate you're showing that you're not caring or compassionate. What's going on? Like, right. I care and I'm, I care enough to say you're not meeting our expectation and not in a you're in trouble way, but like, hey, this is who we are. Why aren't you being the kind of person we know that you can be because we believe in you? And right. it, it totally changes the conversation. And I think that's just so important. I wanted to highlight that real quick. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll add one thing in there is that, you know, it's, it's the, the conversation I mentioned, our, our uh, culture committee and, and the conversation between students and staff is so valuable around those things as well. We, we, we had a conversation a while back with students and we kind of went through that and we, we asked them to kind of think about, you know, areas where, you know, they really felt like maybe we had a gap and could, to, like a specific example of where there was a gap with what their experience was. And, and it was telling, I mean, the, the students and these are, we, you know, intentionally select kind of a diverse group of students, but, but really what they need to be is kids that are, you know, thoughtful and can, and can really share what's on their mind. Mm -hmm. And, and to a person, all their stories really came around this idea of I matter and, and feeling like at different times that they didn't matter in, in school. And that was, that was just so powerful to be able to have that conversation with students and staff together in the room. And without having done the, the groundwork to put these statements and these ideas together, I don't think that we would have had the, had the vocabulary necessarily to be able to, you know, name exactly what that issue was. And that doesn't, you know, that doesn't give you the fix, but at least putting it out on the table and being able to, you know, give students the ability to say, oh, wait, this is one thing that I, I don't feel like, you know, we're hitting the mark on. That's a great starting point for the conversations that are, that are otherwise pretty tough to have. Yeah. And it's, and it's really interesting because, you know, most of the time when you think about, we think about somebody getting help or support, 
with some things, you think that they're like struggling with something. But like in my mastermind, for example, I only work with high performing principles. I don't, I don't take on people who are like struggling and need a plan of improvement. I only take on those people who are, who are doing the best they can and are aspiring to be even greater. And I, I bring that up only because once somebody's part of that group and they're like, I'm a high performing principal, then it changes what they believe about themselves. And that is true for kids and for adults and for everybody in between. And so hearing kids say, I matter, you know, helping us recognize that that's what they need to feel is vital to us being able to, to help them become the people that we all know they can become. And, and if they don't feel like they matter to us, then how are they ever going to reach that goal of being the kind of graduate that you want them to be? They're right. just not going to. Right, right. So Brian, the last question I ask in each interview is what is one thing that a principal can do this week to be a transformative principal like you? So, um, well, the way you word it is great because I, I will be the first one to tell you I don't have all the answers. But, you know, it, what, what originally started the conversation between the two of us, like you mentioned, was that connection uh, with teacher and with, with uh, you know, I was, I happened to be sitting outside one day. I, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that the reason was not all that uh, glorious that I was sitting outside. We, we had been having some, some trouble with some graffiti at the bathroom sort of near where I was sitting there and also inside the building where I was sitting. So what I, what we, we were a little bit frustrated by the situation and uh, you know, we'd, we'd made a couple different reach outs. We'd had uh, put out, you know, a request to have teachers talk with students. I think, I don't know if it was before or after that I had made a, a little bit of a plea out to um, students directly and just, you know, put some information out to them about, you know, uh, how we live in the kind of environment that we create for ourselves. And, you know, there's 2,400 students and, and only about 150 or so adults. And so they have a lot of power to create this environment. We expect them to take responsibility for it and, you know, help us to solve this problem as well. And the reason I bring that up is because I, I think that to me, the answer to the question for me is starts with just presence. I, I just think that that's um, sometimes we we tend to overcomplicate things that we do, and the single most I think important thing that I do every day is actually the easiest thing that I do every day, which is standing outside the front gate for fifteen minutes and you know waving to uh, parents as they drop off, saying hi to the kids as they show up. Um, you know, ha having those little conversations, you know, obviously we have some of our staff out there as well. And, you know, that chance to just be visible, to connect with people, to let people know you're there, to make it easy for them to approach you is to me, I think these, the single most important thing that a, a principal can do is, is just being present, being visible, being accessible. And, you know, when we've been through the things, you know, with all the remote learning coming down, uh, you know, I think I mentioned to you, you know, the things we're trying to do in, in that environment, or if you, if you were at a remote school normally, you know, visibility is something is looks different, right. But it's still about the same thing. It's still about having a presence, having communication, uh, letting people know how they can access you and, and that you're there and care about them and what's going on. I just, I think that we can uh, often as principals uh, cut out a lot of the stuff that we spend our time doing uh, and maybe dedicate a little more to that idea of presence and, and probably benefit both ourselves and our staffs and our students. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is, that is incredibly powerful. Thank you so much, Brian, for being part of Transformative Principle. You can follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Brockett with two T's at the end. And his school account is at Carlsbad Lancers. Thanks again, Brian, so much for being part of Transformative Principle. Thanks for having me. It's great to talk. Thank you to our valued partner, John Cat Educational. If you are a leader looking to make transformative change by providing yourself and your leaders and teachers with professional development that is research-based and rigorous, yet easy to digest and full of practical strategies, check out the latest publications from John Cat. Visit us.johncatbookshop.com to find information on bulk orders or learn much more in our show notes. You can also use the code transformative to save a bundle at us.johncatbookshop.com.